Okay, so uh, welcome back. And uh, uh, this afternoon, I'll be talking about object detection and object tracking. Now, so far, the problems that we've been working with or we've been talking about was image classification. So you have K classes, and the task is assign the correct class label to the whole image, right? Uh, so uh, there's a big difference between classification and detection. Detection involves both classification and also localization. Given an image, we want to localize all the instances of the objects or the object categories and also recognize that object. Okay. Um, what? Right, sorry. So the problem formulation is the following. We have a set of predefined categories and given an input image, uh, the desired output is the location of the object and also the object categories. Um, so uh, before I talk about how to perform object detection, let's talk about how we actually evaluate the performance of an object detector. So given an, the test image, like uh, previously unseen, uh, for example, we can run a person detection and it might output a bounding box and with some confidence score, uh, like how likely that the detector or how high the detector, the detector thinks that this e actually correspond to a person. Uh, so you run it that you know that is the first detection, the second detection, and so on so forth. And you can rank the detection based on the score. You know you can go down from the rank list. The one with the highest score is the first output, and the second output the have lower score but still a person. The third one has. Uh, uh, even lower score and run it doesn't correspond to a person and then you can output you know but at the same time uh, in the image there are multiple ground truth annotation or multiple region that has been uh, annotated manually annotated but by humans as uh, correspond to the objects that you have so essentially given an image we have a set of ground truth bounding boxes for the location of the object and the detector will return a rank list of the uh, predicted output. So the ground truth is the purple box, and the output by the detector is a set of region with the score, which is the orange box here. All right. Now, uh, usually we shot uh, we sort the, the the output based on the confidence score or the score of the detector. Say, you know. As I said, the top one, the score is 0 0.9, the next one 0 0.8, so on, so forth, okay? And for each of the detection we have, we can consider, we call it a, a true positive. It actually overlap highly, it, it overlap a lot with one of the crowd truth bounding boxes, then we call it a true positive, it's a true detection. The one that doesn't overlap with any ground truth bounding boxes or uh, or it has very low overlap scores, and we call it a full positive. You know, it should not be detected, right? So you go over, uh, you know, and at some point there's some detection. Um, uh, uh, the ones that you know, the bounding boxes that does not correspond to any ground truth is called the full positive, right? Now, usually for detection, we need to pick a threshold, like for you know based on the score of the detector, if the score is greater than the threshold, then we return the detection. We say, okay, these are the objects that I detected. The detection with lower scores and uh, is that discuss them. Okay, this is the detection score is too low. We're not even to consider them. So usually the eva evaluation metric is the following. Uh, based on the threshold T, you can count the number of true positive. Remember, the true positive is the one that have a detection that have like highly overlap with that detection, so it called true positive. And the precision value at the threshold T is the ratio between the true positive over the all the things that you call positive. Essentially, among all the things that above the threshold T, how many of them are actually correspond to true positive? That's called the precision. Yes. So among all the things that you say they are positive. 
how many of them are actually correspond to the true positive that, that has a correct ground truth correspond to it. It's called the true positive, and this is called the precision. And another important value in detection is called the recall. It means that of all the ground truth bounding boxes, all the objects that you're supposed to detect, how many of them you actually detect? So in this case, it is the ratio between the true positive over all the number of ground truth objects. So that's the recall value. Yeah? So detection is the game balancing between precision and recall. You can have a detector that have uh, a high recall by basically lowering the threshold. And in this case, you have higher recall because you detect more objects. But at the same time, if you do so, you might lower the precision. At the same time, you can, can restrict yourself to something very high, very confident. In this case, you have high precision, but you have low recall. So normally, by varying the threshold, you can plot something called the precision recall curve, which is basically the characteristic curves that tell you how good this detector is. Essentially, the ideal curve is the one that go from the top left corner to the top right corner, and then go down to the bottom right, in this case. And uh, usually, in a, in a paper, to, to succinctly summarize uh, 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 the performance curve, you might use the area under the curve, and in this case, it's called the AP. It is short for uh, average precision, basically the average precision, uh, precision at different threshold. One of the nice things about this uh, uh, evaluation, evaluation metric is you don't have to pick the threshold. Or essentially, you consider all the threshold, and then you can summarize the performance of the classifier of this. So to compare different detectors, you can compare the two performance curves, or you compare the area of those curves, if, if you want. All right? Is there any question on uh, Every precision, precision recall, or how we evaluate the detection performance. Did I make it clear enough? Uh, uh, we have a question right here. So let's what do the two colored lines represent? The two color lines, it, it usually, uh, you have the precision recall, and you would assume that you know, this precision recall is somewhat like uh, it should decrease monotonically in the sense that you know, if you have one higher recall, then you can lower the precision. So essentially, you, there's a procedure when you can assume something like that. Okay? So essentially, uh, at, not just based on the threshold, it's based on some other value, you can make the curve a little bit higher, like right, by flattening it out. But I think uh, that's the one. Yeah. Hi, I understand that these uh, uh, bounding box, which corresponds to ground truth, and the other one uh, which has been detected, has been has has some similarities score matching at the backside. Yeah. And uh, I just I'm just curious to ask. Uh, how these uh, ranked are put up like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, is this hypothetical or maybe some standardized or maybe some our own guess? Sorry. So, no, I haven't talked about how to compute those score yet. But usually it, it, uh, uh, you can think about, if, for example, in SVM, you can have the value of the SVM, the output, the classification score they tend to correspond to probability, but they might not be probabilities. I see. I thought perhaps but the distance between maybe the images values captured and not captured from the bonding was... No, so that is the overlap. Intersection, yeah. So it's the intersection over the union is the how we decide whether this is a true positive or true uh, or false positive. So that is basically the based on the ground truth box and the one so you can compute the overlap score. But the number on top is the score that yeah, yeah. output by the detector that we're going to talk about it uh, very soon. Okay, thank but you. All right, I hope to uh, make it clear before we move on. Any other question? All right, so if 
Mm, not then. Um, okay, so in general, uh, uh, object detection is a, a difficult problem because there's a very new, uh, many new uh, variables here from illumination, pose, clutter, occlusion, intra class appearance to viewpoint changes. Um, uh, so the, there's, there's challenges in modeling the object classes you now. Uh, essentially, we need to distinguish between the true detection, the, the ones that really corresponding to the object that you want to detect, and you know some other uh, uh, false detection, basically. And there are several types of mistakes that uh, one uh, the detector can make. The first one is bad localization. You might detect the object, but the return bounding box that you have is very far away from the ground shoot bounding box. Essentially, it is either it is too big or too small compared with the ground shoot bounding box. Now, the detector might detect the wrong object; it confused with similar objects. So, cat might be you know of uh, a, a, a cat might be mistaken as a dog um, because they both of them are furry. Isn't? Uh, a detector might detect, you know, so, um, confused with the background, uh, or it might be confused with dissimilar objects. The background is basically something that doesn't correspond to any, any object when dissimilar object it is an object, but it's not the, the right object that you want to detect. So the general process of object de uh, recognition is the following. Every single object detector has the, you know, somewhat follows uh, the following uh, pipeline. The first thing is when you do the object detection, you need to specify an object model, and then it comes to generate the hypothesis from the image, and then you have to score the hypothesis, and the final step is to resolve detection. Now, so the first step is specify an object model. There are multiple ways uh, you can specify an object model. The simplest one is say, okay, I'm going to specify my object detector by the bounding box of this. I'm going to use an axis align bounding box to represent the location of the object. In this case, the way that you specify it is just four numbers for the left, right, top, and bottom of the object. Okay? This work this tend to work very well and it fits many types of objects, but for uh for some object, very elongated object, it might not be the right model for, for, for that. The second type is you can say, okay, what might uh, you know an object? The object, uh, an object, basically, you know, the object tend to be composed. You can decompose object into parts. In order for me to recognize a uh, object, I need to recognize its constituent parts, right? In order for me to recognize this is a face, I, I need to to detect eyes, nose, mouth, and those. Uh, to detect a bicycle, I need to detect the two wheel. Uh, the pedal and something like that, okay? Or, you know, if it's something more uh, sophisticated, you can say, okay, the object, you know, I should specify the mask. In this case, uh, my object model is essentially uh, uh, the binary label inside the bounding box. Uh. Now, the second step is uh, to generate hypothesis. Uh, Essentially, given an image, the location of object can be anywhere, essentially. So uh, we need to come up with a list of hypotheses from that we can test whether this is the right object uh, or not. Um, okay, so one very uh, simple or also at the same time very popular approach is to use something called the sliding window approach. Suppose that you have an object detector, uh, uh, assume it's pedestrian, for example. So you have a template for the pedestrian. What you do is you test the patch at each location and scale. You, you do the sliding window at every location. You test you know, how likely that window corresponding to that one corresponds to the object that you want to detect. So you consider that particular window at multiple location. So to detect the object at different scale, you basically you resize the image to that particular scale, and here you apply the sliding window again. Uh, 
Note that the template did not change the size, the image changed the size. So essentially, by doing so, you do the sliding window at multiple locations and scale. So that's how you evade. So that's one way of generating multiple hypotheses for the location of the object. Now imagine if you want to test, uh, 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 you know, detect object of with different aspect ratios, and you, you have to basically change the aspect ratio. So essentially, object detection is uh, coming up with, on, on the second step of object detection, is uh, coming up with the set of hypotheses that you can, from each of this, you, you, you put it through a classifier, and then you evaluate how likely it corresponds to the object. Okay. The problem with the sliding window approach is it, very uh, time consuming. Uh, as I, uh, as I, I said, uh, uh, here you consider multiple location and multiple scale. That is uh, usually the old way that we have been using. But uh, recently, or you know, uh, maybe 10 years from 10 years ago, uh, there's a second approach. It's uh, something called try to generate the hypothesis based, it's called the region proposal. Essentially, uh, it's starting from low-level Q of an image. Uh, it's going to generate several locations of bounding boxes that most likely to correspond to the object. So um, how it works is, for example, uh, one, this is one of the approach for uh, generating the proposals. It's essentially starting with the low-level um, pixel uh, value, low-level color information and then it progressively groups them together, and then from that it generates the bounding boxes which is corresponding to what it think it might be possible location or correspond to the object. So you start with uh, uh, the pixel, and uh, you group the pixel of similar color together, and in, in, in uh, vision we, we tend to call it super pixel, which is the pixel that correspond to a group of pixel with some similar property. By grouping them into super pixel, grouping super pixel together, you have a larger region from that you can, uh, you can come up or you can identify some proposal for possible candidate for the object. Um, there are the different approaches for generating object proposal and the one that I just show you coming from the uh, what uh, what I call based on the color information from the pixel value to color to super pixel. Uh, there another approach called the edge box. So in this case, it uh, is starting from the edges. Uh, uh, so this morning I talk about how using the filter to extract some structure, and this structure is uh, basically based on the the edges, which is the one that correspond to the value with high uh, gradient magnitude. Okay, so the edges, so from the edges you can uh, generate some hypothesis. And in general, for natural images, people, you tend to use like 1,000 object proposal or 2,000 object proposal. And from that, they, uh, you only have to evaluate like, let's say 2,000 object proposal instead of you have to do the sliding window at multiple location, okay? So, uh, uh, so I just gave you two examples of ways for generating hypothesis. One is uh, doing sliding window at multiple locations and scale. The other one is bottom-up approach coming from low-level vision, from color value or the edge information, and to come up with uh, um, uh, the hypothesis for the objects. Okay, so the third step of an object detector is uh, now we have a set of hypotheses. We need to score them. We need to uh, basically evaluate every single hypothesis to see how likely each of them correspond to uh, the object of interest and what is the score of that data. So in this case, you can use you know uh, our favorite classifier. It could be an SVM. It could be Adabus. Uh, Adabus was very popular for face detection um, uh, in 2001, which means like 15, more than 15 years ago. Uh, uh, right now in OpenCV, you still have the Adabus OpenCV detector, uh, but you can also have SVM, nearest neighbor, you know, you can, you know, 
uh, all you need is a classifier, and in this case, given a region, classify whether it's the object or not. And we already talked about uh, image classification, uh, okay? Uh, so nowadays, most of the detectors are actually based on CNN features. So uh, uh, 10 years ago, people used uh, um, handcrafted feature like Sif and Hawk or the things that we talked about this morning, but now it has been essentially you fit in the network, the image patch to the CNN uh, network, and then it output a classification score, okay? And the CNN or classifier has been trained to separate from the positive example from the negative uh, example. All right, and the final step of uh, uh, object detection is, uh, oh, why did I say object recognition? Um, is it to resolve the detection, you might have multiple hypotheses and, uh, and the hypothesis might overlap with each other, but you have, uh, you know, when two things overlap too much, you might want to keep only one. So one of the uh, common approach is to perform something called the non-maximum suppression. Essentially, if two bounding boxes have uh, highly overlap with each other, you keep the one with the highest score, and then you suppress, you remove all the detections that overlap with the one that you already output. Uh, if the overlap, in general, the, uh, the, the, the threshold you use is 0.5%, the intersection over the union. If it's greater than 0.5, then you uh, suppress the one with lower score, okay? So this step is called non-maximum suppression. Essentially, let me say it again, non-maximum suppression is you go uh, over the hypothesis that you have in the order of the classifier. You keep one, if it doesn't overlap significantly with any of the boxes that you already output. If it overlap with one of the ones that you already output, which is the one that higher scores, then you that remove it. Yep. Um, so that is non-maximal suppression. Uh, yeah. For example, in this case, uh, oh, what, what should I say? Anyway, so the second step, uh, uh, another type of uh, resolve, uh, resolving detection score is uh, also often used based on the context or reasoning. For example, um, you can say that you know car should be on the street. It cannot be on the facade of a building, or you know pedestrian should not be seen um, on top of a tree or something like that. So essentially, after you uh, score all the hypotheses, use some extra information to uh, resolve some uh, to, to to remove some full positive uh, cases. Um, okay, so. One of the uh, um, early work uh, that worked quite well for pedestrian detection is something called the Dalatric Pedestrian Detector. So this one, is, uh, the template for the, the detector is of the size 64 by 128 pixel window. So that's a template for the pedestrian, okay? And the feature for evaluation is based on Hawk, a histogram of gradient, which is the feature within a window. And to score a window, we can use a linear SVM to score the window. And the fourth step is to perform non-maximum suppression to, to remove overlap detection with lower score. So this was uh, a popular approach uh, for pedestrian detection uh, up until uh, 10 years ago. All right, uh, is there any question on... Uh, so what I just talk about is the, the four step uh, or the four common step in object detection. Um, I stop here for some question. Um, I missed something um, in the previous slide, oh. and can you explain again? Because I missed something. Oh, okay. this this one. Yeah. Um, can you explain again? Yes. So for example. Uh, so, so the you know one you have you know the first step is to use the context to remove 
false detection. For example, in this, for example, I don't know if you can see, uh, there's one detection of the pedestrian on here. Uh, based on the local information, the gradient of this, it looked like a person. But using the contact, you know, a pedestrian should not be on top of a pole on the street normally. You don't say, see that. So you can use that contact information to say, okay, this is very unlikely to correspond to a pedestrian. Let me remove it. So, uh, so those are the... Uh, the the classifier evaluate a detection based on the thing within the object bounding box, within the window. But using context, it means you use the thing outside it. Or you, see, you make extra assumption, use something to remove the false detection. No, it's not manually, but automatically. But uh, you come up with some heuristic, okay, if, let's say, very simple, let's say, uh, let's say you, you assume that suppose that you go outside on the street of Bangkok, you take a photo, you should not see a pedestrian on the upper half of the image. Something like that. Okay? There's some, some other methods that automatically figure out the ground plane of the street and the facade of the building. So, but some things that I just tell you that are very simple. But, you know. Uh, okay, so so what I just told you was uh, what is object detection and the steps in object detection. Uh, so for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to talk about uh, two approaches. One is called a two-state approach, and uh, the second one is called a single-state approach. And finally, I uh, describe a case study of how to build a hand detection, a hand detector. Okay, let's start with two-state approach. Uh, two-state approach is uh, the following. It's called region CNN or RCNN. Uh, this one is also very popular. I assume it has more than 10,000 citations. Okay? Um, so the step of RCNN is the following. Okay? The first step, you have an input image. You... Um, uh, you you do some you extract some region proposals using HBox or selective search the methods that I showed you earlier for detecting about two thousand proposal for this image. Now for each proposal that you have, you warp it to the correct size of a neural network. Remember a network that has been trained on image net they tend to have a fixed size input. So in this case, even though the bounding boxes that you have have different aspect ratio, different size, you need to resize it, you know, up sample or down sample, or scale it so that it fit the same input size of the network that you already trained the network on. When you fit the region proposal into the network, uh, you, um, it's going to output the score just like for classification. Essentially, this one is very similar to what we just talked about using the proposal, extracting CNN feature, and fit into the classifier to say whether it is the object uh, to classify that region. Now, there's one, uh, one extra step. Here's the step number five, is, is to do the regression to find the Titan bounding boxes. So, the region proposal that we started with might not be the tie bounding box for the object. And there's one extra step, so step five, is to learn a function that learn to how do I wiggle, how to, how to change these four corners so I have a tighter bounding box. And this step is called uh, bounding box regression. And the final step, like before, is to apply non-maximum suppression. Okay? So this Pipeline is essentially the ones that I just told you earlier. There's nothing new. The only two things new is we attract CNN feature uh, instead of using Hawk or some mm, handcrafted feature. And there's one uh, extra step which is bounding back regression. Okay? 
this step uh, detection a the pipeline for inference for testing given input image how do you detect uh, uh, object uh, what about training okay uh, training is important so let me talk about the training procedure for RCNN here so RCNN the training of RCNN is a multi stage pipeline so essentially it's a uh, it's a transfer learning again, guys. It's a fine tuning the CNN network with softmax classifier. You use a backbone network. The network has been trained to recognize one thousand classes from ImageNet, and we fine tune it or we train it to recognize the twenty uh, categories that you are interested in or whatever the categories that you are interested in. But again, you start with the network that has been trained on million of images on thousand of classes to start with. All right, so another step of the training is to train a linear SVM, essentially that you know, we you compute the feature from the CNN and then you, uh, you, you train the li uh, linear SVM to output. And the final step, uh, or the extra step that we need to do is uh, to train the bounding box regression. Uh, I'm going to talk about each of these steps right now. Okay, the first step is uh, the training of RCNN is fine tuning. Now, as I said again before, you need to start with a pre trained network for classification. And in this case, they did start with a pre trained network for classification. You replace uh, the classification layer by the randomly initialized n plus one way classification layer, where n is the, object the number of object class and you add one actual output for the background, the rest of the network uh, is unchanged, okay? Uh, and then once you replace the output layer to fit with the object categories that you have, you continue doing stochastic gradient descent training of CNN parameters using only the warp region proposal. Uh, and in this case, uh, to for the to, to fine tune it, you, you treat all the region proposal which have significant overlap. It means the threshold overlap of the IOU overlap with a ground truth boxes as positive, and for the box class uh, and uh, and the the rest as negative. Okay, so what is IOU? IOU stand for intersection over union. Suppose you have two boxes, one correspond to the ground truth one correspond to the predicted output of, or the proposal. The intersection is, you know, yes, the intersection of two boxes. And the union is the union of two boxes. And if this, if the area of this is greater than 0 0.5, then you say that, you know, the proposal correspond to a true positive and you use this as positive for training. If the proposal does not, the overlap is very low, then you say, oh, this is a negative and I, uses a negative example for training my classifier. All right. Um, okay, so after this step, uh, there's a, there's a f um, after fine tuning the CNN, we use the CNN feature as a training data for SVM. And in this case, uh, multiple linear SVM are trained for one versus uh, rest SVM. And uh, the label using, again, using the IOU overlap threshold of 0 0.3. Uh, and in this case, the, the authors do some uh, uh, parameter tuning using grid search to figure out the threshold that they yield, that, that optimal for, on, or optimal for the task, okay? Uh, so one of the feature ad attracted using training label are apply, optimize one linear SVM per class. So, so far, it is that attracting CNN, uh, fine-tuning the CNN, and then training the classifier based on the CNN features. Um, the, um, the important uh, step, and also the new step here, is bounding box regression. Uh, essentially, th uh, the goal is given a proposal with some like four corner, left, right, top, and bottom, you want to regress it to a tighter bounding box that correspond to the object. Okay, 
So the training data for that is uh, an end training pass of the proposal and the ground truth. And a proposal is four numbers, and a ground truth is also a four number. So as essentially, we want to learn a function to map four numbers to four numbers. And the way uh, RCNN do so is using something called learning, you know, they, they first do some transformation of the target. So the transformation is defined, okay, the predicted uh, uh, ground truth bounding box uh, is, uh, is a linear function based on the width and the location of Px. Uh, so I say, so the width, uh, this P, P, PW and PX, PY, PS are known. So these are the things that we need to learn. DXP, DYP, and uh, the, the regression target is defined based on the ground truth and the proposal. So essentially, we want to learn DXP to map with TX, DYP to map with TY, and uh, this uh, DWP to, to map with uh, TW. So we want to learn four regression functions to map from PX, PY, PW, PH to uh, TX, TY, TW, TH here. So these are target values. Uh, and the regression function are four regression function. So what is P? P or these, uh, these sub star P is basically uh, a, a is the feature function of the in the pool five feature proposal of P, and it denoted that five uh, five um, five sub five of P. Okay, so you learn this regression function using read regression basically. So essentially, define the target and the, learn four function to map from the feature vector to the the target value. I, and you can optimize this using read regression, which is that linear regression with an extra regularization uh, to penalize for the norm of W. Okay. Oh. I think it's a good time to take some questions. Any, uh, any question? Uh, can you explain again about like the value of p? Like what is the phi of p to train the regression bounding box? Yes. Yes. Okay, so um, essentially we, uh, so this is the target variable. One we estimate it, right? Then we can, uh, using this formulation to regress from the proposal to the ground truth. Now, to learn to map to this target variable, we want to use the deep learning feature, the one that's describing the region. Okay, so what it is? So D sub star P is, um, is a linear function, which is as a feature vector on this region P, and there's a vector that tells us how much uh, correspond to it. So it's a linear function of the feature phi sub star P. Okay, so, and this function is uh, it, it taken as uh, the feature phi power p is basically the feature that attracted at that location p in the feature map of the CNN. Uh, so you extracted the features using CNN and yes, and then use this regression. to learn the regression to how much I, I should move or how much I should change my regressor. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I, I still don't understand like what what are P and G is in in this page, like P P in the, in the proposal uh, that should be mapped to the ground truth bounding box P I is the proposal should map it to the ground truth bounding box G I because they have significant overlap. However, uh, having significant overlap doesn't mean that it fit perfectly. So I want somehow to use the feature within my proposal to
to tell me, okay, I have to move a little bit to the right or you know to the left, so so it fits the box tightly. So that is what it exactly mean. In order for me to learn this function, I need some training data. Essentially, I collect many pairs of the proposal and the corresponding ground truth. I define some transformations that can map from the proposal to the ground truth. And then I learn a function, a linear function, from the feature of the proposal to how much I should move. And um, it's, I know there's a lot of details in here, but uh, uh, that's the main ideas. And if you have to implement, then you can refer to it. Yeah. I don't understand. I don't understand why you have to move the the p bounding box to to the same exact same location as g when you can already tell like what classes are, are, are predicted in p and no no so 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 the p is the one that coming up from the region proposal. There's some uh, bottom up mechanism to give me some hypothesis for where the local object is. But each of these hypotheses is might be a good detection. It overlaps with the object, but it not it doesn't fit the object tightly. And I want to change this so it fit the object better. So this is to correct the the correct for some 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 boxes. small misalignment. Let's say that for big uh, misalignment you cannot because you, you actually doing uh, you evaluate multiple hypotheses at different location. So that essentially you handle. You do the localization by evaluate multiple location, and you use this step to f kind of uh, refine the location. So this this is uh, independent from the 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 object detection process. Um, this is independent of the uh, window classification process. You, you you have the hypothesis. You have to classify it. You have to score them, how likely is the object. But then once you have the score, you have to refine the bounding box. So it doesn't change the way that you use CNN at all? It, it is done it doesn't, after that? It, it doesn't change the way you use CNN, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, There's no contextual reasoning here. Not yet. Yeah. Uh, for the location, it's, it's from the linear location, but why for the width and height, we, we take the function like lock on this one? Yes, you need to go back into, uh, because uh, lock uh, basically in the scale space, uh, when you take the lock, it becomes linear. So in uh, in images like uh, let's say uh, w let's say w when you um, upsample an image up to from one to two or you downsample from one to zero point five, you want to say okay this is the opposite of each other, but you can see that if that subtract in linear with one minus two it is minus one, one minus zero point five it is zero point five, but if you take the log scales it become linear. Thank you. All right, let's move on then. Uh, um, there's one problem with uh, RCNN. It works well, but it's very, very slow. <laughs> Do you know why? Because you have 2,000 region, and you have to fit 2,000 region into the CNN and evaluate it. Essentially, you have to run the network multiple times, 2,000 times, so it's very slow. Okay, so this author figure out a better way of doing so, and they call it fast RCNN. Fast RCNN is almost the same with RCNN, which uh, with the following modification, the image is fed into the network only once. You have a feature map. And for each reason proposal, uh, you pull the information within the proposal and use it for evaluation. So remember before, 
for each recent proposal, you extract the image patch for that proposal and you feed into the network. Now, what you do is you feed the entire image to the network and you have a feature map and look at the recent proposal you actually you pull information within the proposal in the feature map not so you can think about it the RCNN a uh, look at the recent proposal in the image space this one look at the recent proposal in the feature space the one that already done like output the convolution so that's why this step can be uh, done only once and the remaining step so that's why it's very fast yeah so that call it fast RCN. It's exactly the same or almost the same with RCNN, except the reason proposal, the pooling, the information to, for evaluation, is extracted at the feature maps, not the input image. Uh, so, so for example, suppose this is the proposal, then you have to reshape it to, uh, let's say, seven by seven, something that you can use it for the for the classification, you can do some subsampling or interpolation or whatever. Uh, so that is called the, uh, in, in, in object detection, it's called the ROI pooling, this ROI pooling layer. Okay, after you have fast RCNN, there's something called faster RCNN. <laughs> How to make it faster? Well. So RCNN and fast RCN depend on an external region proposal algorithm, okay? And the external uh, method for computing the proposal is a computational bottleneck. First of all, it's, it's, it's the output of a fixed method. It cannot be trained. It cannot be trained end-to-end. -end. It cannot be tuned and fitted to network. And this method can be also be slow. So what faster RCNN uh, does, it, it introduce uh, uh, something called the region proposal network. You say, okay, well, I can learn to come up with a list of proposal myself. Why do I, why do I have to rely on some other uh, method, external method to do so? So faster RCNN essentially a fast RCN with a branch to come up with a list of proposals, okay? So, um, the uh, the region proposal f uh, from um, or it's called the RPN right? region proposal network uh, from are uh, used by fast RCN for detection and without the region proposal network or branch um, it is simply fast RCN. Do you have a question or you know okay? Um, so the region proposal network is. Uh, uh, is it built on top of the feature map itself? Uh, it is built by having two additional com convolution layers. The first one encode a convolution map position to a short uh, example, like 256 dimensional feature vector, and the second output an object NIST score and request the bounds for K region proposal relative to the various scale and aspect ratio at that position. So essentially, it learn a network that uh, for each location, looking at the feature at that location, it tell you, okay, how likely he, uh, uh, if I have to uh, chain one of the default boxes anchor at that point, how do I change this so it, the box correspond to one of the object. It might not be the object that you're looking for, but it correspond to some object. So that's why it's called region proposal, the region that correspond to some object. Uh, including the object that you're looking for. Okay, the next one is called mass RCNN. Mass RCNN is basically faster RCNN with an extra branch to predict the mask. So uh, before uh, faster RCNN going to predict the bounding box uh, and the score for the detection, mass RCNN have an extra branch to predict the mask. For the bound, uh, for the bounding box, and it's called mass RCNN. And here's uh, some result of mass RCNN. Uh, you know, it it worked pr pretty well actually, um, and uh, you can 
Actually, you can download uh, the code. Uh, uh, this, um, th this series of work is based on Facebook, and then there's a library called Detection. You can download this library and run it, and then it works uh, uh, work very well. The only problem with mass, uh, the detection is, is beyond cafe, uh, which is sometimes it's harder to, uh, to install than some other deep learning library like PyTorch or TensorFlow. Uh, this day, normally when you have a library, I, what I suggest you is uh, before you spend a lot of time doing installation of the library, if you want just to test it out, the first thing I suggest you to do is to look for the Docker image of that. You test it. If it works very well, then you spend some effort installing the library. If it doesn't work, then forget about it. <laughs> All right? Because sometimes you spend like uh, one day installing and then, oh, ah, oh, it doesn't work very well. Yeah, so cafe, when you install it, you need some root, uh, 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 root privilege or whatever, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I tend not to use cafe. Uh. Yeah, some, some other result. Uh. Um, okay, so that uh, basically uh, it con concludes the part talking about the Stutes approach, uh, which, uh, any question? Yes, there's, uh, there's uh, one at the very, uh, very end. Okay. I'm curious, um, how does the extra bunch help in mass RCNN? So y you mentioned that mass RCNN is like a faster RCNN uh, with an extra branch. Yes. So I'm just still curious, like how does the branch, the extra branch, help with the detection? I don't know if it actually helps with the detection or not. It's just, uh, um, no, I, I don't know enough to tell you how much it helps. I just know that uh, you can think about it as an additional branch. So whether it helps or not, I, I'm not familiar with it to tell you. And what is the benefit? Then? Oh, the benefit is yeah. you have a mask. <laughs> so it's better than the bounding box. So uh, That's it. <laughs> look, this one is much better than giving you the bounding box of the object, right? Oh. Not only you have, uh, you have the boundary of the object, and if you want to evaluate the performance, now you can take the intersection over the union of the mask with the ground truth instead of the bounding box. So it... Uh, it, it it's a nicer result and okay. also That's more accurate, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, gotcha. Thank you. I think there's a question at the very end. Okay. Uh, in the traffic light, it have something look like a person. Why it don't detect like person? Yes. Oh, uh, <laughs> is it example? If if it have if it have a some person from uh, a bit far from here, and the side it will be the same. It will be detect. Yeah, well, it, it, good good spot. Uh, I think uh, true, but uh, maybe in this case, why it doesn't detect as a person? Maybe. Uh, the, the object is quite small in the first place, and maybe based on the context of something surrounding, it doesn't think that it might be might not be a person. I I, I guess, uh, yeah. Any other question? Yes. Uh, actually, relating to the practical preparation or pre-processing, generally, uh, how do you do for the 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 boundary? I mean, masking and the uh, the bounding the boundary. I found some tools, but one I want to make uh, uh, in real project not very efficient. Uh, if you have uh, some kind of you know, uh, labeling tools or automatic labeling kind of useful tool, let us know. Yes, yeah, so uh, I suggest uh, OpenCV4 has a labeling tool called uh, CVAT, uh, CVAT, Computer Vision Annotation Tool. 
is uh, it can be installed in local machine or you can you can uh, you can push it to Amazon uh, webs uh, AWS and then have label. Uh, I haven't actually used this, but I have installed it. So we have someone install it, uh, annotate it uh, locally, but not on Amazon. So, but I I think it's very good. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, useful information. Okay, let's uh, resume. Uh, all right, so um, so let's uh, now let me talk about the single stage approach. Uh, single stage detectors. So so far, uh, I talk about RCNN, fast RCNN, faster RCNN, and mass RCNN. So these are considered two. two uh, these all have two stages. The first state is region proposal, and the second state is classification and regression. So the single state detector do not have the region proposal stage. All right. Um, so one of the uh, representative method for this one is called the single shot multi-box detector. So it add more convolutional layers to the end of the truncated base network, and this layer decrease in size progressively and allow prediction of detection at multiple scales. So how does it work? Now suppose that at the feature layer of the size m by n. P channel, that the feature map a P channel and the width and uh, the height and width M by N. So the basic element for predicting parameter of potential detection is a, a small 3 by 3 by P small kernel that's going to produce either a score for a category or a shape offset relative to the default box coordinates. So the spatial resolution of the feature map is M by N, so you're going to have M by N location where the kernel is applied. It's going to produce an output vector at M by N location. And the dimension of each output vector is K times 4 plus C. What is K? K is the number of the default bounding boxes associated with each feature, uh, feature map cell. 4 is the 4 offset value relative to the original default bounding box. And C is the number of classes. So essentially what it does is for each default bounding box at each location, it's going to tell you how to change this bounding box to fit with the object. And also it's going to output the classification score for C classes. All right. So in summary, the input layer is M by N by P, and the output is M by N by K times 4 plus C. K is the number of default bounding boxes, and C is the number of classes. So what are default bounding boxes? So suppose that we have a feature map, like 8 by 8 feature map, like what I show on here. Each cell of the feature map corresponds to a set of something called the anchor box or the default bounding boxes. In this case, I'm showing uh, uh, how many? Uh, 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 maybe three? Three bounding boxes with respect to the one in the center. Okay, right. So, uh, so let's, let, let me say it again. For the feature map, each location is going to have a set of default bounding boxes associated with that particular location. These bounding boxes have different aspect ratio, and the ratio could be like one, two, three, one and a half, one over th uh, a third. Uh, and the scale of the bounding box, the size of this when it corresponds to the detector is determined by the number of the feature map that you want to output the detection. And uh, the scale is basically defined by, you know, suppose that you want to detect an object with minimum size as min, maximum size as max. So you have to divide the scale to different feature layers. So each feature map corresponds to some small range of scale, okay? The feed, let me say it again. You want to build a detector for multiple feature map. The feature map is going to have different resolution, uh, different spatial resolution, 
each feature map corresponds to uh, the object at different scale. Okay, the smaller feature map corresponds to bigger scale uh, uh, or bigger smaller scale of the object, and in, you get what I mean. Okay, so the, the scale is determined by the number of feature map and the minimum and the maximum that you want to detect. And the aspect ratio is predefined, and then there's some formula that they define, okay, how to associate a particular position with some default bounding boxes. All right? Um, so, uh, once you have the default bounding boxes for each location, you, you match a ground truth boxes to the default box with the best IOU. So essentially, a ground truth box has at least one correspondent, and you match the default boxes to any ground truth box with the IOU greater than 0 0.5. And now the training is that essentially similar to what you've done with the uh, uh, RCNN. You train using the feature inside the uh, correspond to the, uh, the location of 3 by 3 by P of the feature map. You're going to learn the classification for K, uh, C classes and also the regression parameters. So uh, for each box, so for each location, you have the, the four boxes and you learn how to regress from that to the, uh, um, the crowd shoot box and also output the score. So training is, uh, so the objective function co consists of two parts. One is the confidence score, which is for the classification score. Of course, you want to output the correct class. And the location score, of course, you want to the output bounding box to fit, uh, you know, to precisely with the, um, uh, with, 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 with the crowd truth uh, location. Now, so there's one important step in object detection that I haven't talked about that I should tell you now, which is hard negative mining. What happened in object detection is you have an image and the number of positive examples is outnumbered by the number of negative examples. Okay, so you have many more negative examples. Negative examples are the ones that do not correspond to the crowd truth. So in general, you have much, many more uh, negative and you have uh, fewer positive. If you don't balance this well, then you, you focus too much on the negative sample and it doesn't learn well the positive concept. So, uh, uh, but you don't know what samples to use as a negative, so you want to use the one that most maximally confused with the positive one. So that we call the hard negative mining. You should only, you, you, of all the negative example, choose the one that can be confused easily, be confused with the positive example, and use it for training. So that's going to uh, uh, help you or uh, not to waste too much effort on the easy example. So, uh, so, so for the SSD, the step in this case, the after the matching step, most of the default boxes are negatives. And this creates the imbalance between the positive and negative. So what they have is they have the, the evaluate the proposals about the one with the highest score are uh, used for as a hard negative for training further. Okay, so um, um, I've been talking about the general object detector, but there's one particular class that is extremely important, which is phase detection, that, uh, and it has a lot of application, and I should, uh, uh, that's why I want to, to talk about it uh, also, because this is a special class, which is very important. Now, uh, nowadays, a lot of the, you know, one, one of the things that people like to use is state-of-the-art called the single-state headless phase detector, or SSH. And it's a method which is similar to SSD to detect phases, especially tiny phases. Now, it has scale invariant, which is uh, achieved by using three detect modules on three different size feature maps. Uh, and it's you context module which makes use of context information. Now let me tell you a little bit about it. So, so this is the architecture of the SSH. So it's a fully convolutional network with added detection module for phase localization and classification. 
Now, this, this approach is also a single stage. It doesn't have the proposal step, okay? Uh, so essentially, it has multiple proposal at each location, and, and it do regression and scoring at the same time. So SSS uh, regress a set of predefined bounding boxes called the anchors at each location. Remember, each location has an, uh, some anchors, and each anchor, the scale of the anchor corresponds to the size that it's responsible for. Uh, so it is very similar to the proposal of bounding box regression in faster RCNN or SSD. Now, but in the case of SSS, they, go, they use a single aspect ratio. And the author reported that there's no performance improvement with multiple aspect ratio, uh, probably because the faces are roughly square. So they can just use a single aspect ratio in this case. Um, for the detection mo modules of SSS, there's a three detection modules are used. Then they also use something, the context module, which incorporates the context by basically in enlarging the window around the candidate uh, proposal. Essentially, if, uh, you know, if a, a region corresponds to the face, then if you extend the region a little bit, it should correspond to head and shoulder. Okay, so in many cases, the face is blur, and you can look for the shoulder and the head, and that, that is the context that can help you to detect very tiny faces. So that's what, uh, what, uh, what, they, uh, what they use. Uh, so the anchor matching. So, um, so you distribute the anchor based on the side to the three models. So there are three models for three different uh, uh, f for detection, and they respond you know, for detecting faces of different scale. And so they divide uh, the faces to uh, the corresponding to models, and each anchor is matched to a ground truth face if uh, the the IOU is greater than 0 0.5. Again, they use a hard negative mining. They select a negative anchor with highest score and select a positive anchor with the lowest score for, for training, right? And uh, the, the aspect rate, uh, no, so the ratio between positive and negative is set to, to be one third. Uh, here are some results of uh, uh, using SSH. Um, Okay, so it's uh, it worked uh, very well. Uh, we we have tested it; it worked very well. You know, this one, the one that I I download from uh, the GitHub uh, web uh, side of this. But uh, okay, uh, here are some other results. It can detect very small faces. Uh, at, you know, people on on the crowd, on on the uh, on 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 the eye ring, uh, or on the basketball court, right? Um, now the problem, the only problem with SSS is, is you cafe, <coughs> and cafe is hard to uh, install. And uh, I have it installed on my machine, but uh, uh, after installing some other library, it, you know, it get broken. So I could not run SSS on my machine yet. But so I run it something on. There's another one that's easier to install with uh, pip. It, it's called the MTCNN, which is also very popular for face detection. And I'm show you some. So this is basically. Uh, the phase detection that we just got here. Well, this is the easy image anyway. This is the image that we uh, take this morning for detecting faces. So it detect most of the faces. It actually have a full positive uh, right here. Um, but okay. Uh, but uh, did you see the face here? All right. I hope you see something. Okay. Um, well, of course, it's still not as good as this face detector. Are you ready to see? Hey, this one is extremely good, very hard to beat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, 100 percent accurate. It's very precise. All right, so, um, okay, so the last, uh, the remaining of this today, I'm going to talk about case study. 
on building a hand detector. So this is my own work on uh, how to um, train a network to detect hands in images. So most of my research, uh, so my research is on human action recognition or understanding human behavior and human behavior can uh, many cases be, um, be, be um, can be specified or recognized based on the activity of the hands. So I want to detect hands in images and video. So essentially given an image, I want to detect the location of the hands and also the orientation of the hands. So I look around, there wasn't uh, pre-trained detectors that work well for my, uh, my purpose, so I decided to develop my own, okay? So the first thing, if you want to build a hand, uh, an object detector, you, you need to choose a detection framework. So you have uh, two choices, using one, one single stage or two stages. So we tested with both. And we found that mass RCNN is easier to work with, uh, you know, at least my student found it easier to make it work. It doesn't, uh, doesn't say anything about the other one, but so we chose mass RCNN to, uh, to move forward. Now, when we figure out the framework, you modify the architecture to suit your need. So in this case, uh, we developed something that uh, not only, uh, you know, it outputs the segmentation mass, the bounding box, and also the orientation of the hand. So because we need an actual brand that tells us about you know, that is the information we need, the orientation. So we modify the architecture a little bit to, uh, to output what we, we wanted. Well, the next step is we need training data. Right? So there's not much uh, annotated hands for images in the Y. So the first uh, thing we did is we set out to collect some data set of hands. So, uh, so we introduced first a TV hand data set of about 10,000 images extracted from TV series with uh, around 9,000 hands. Uh, we chose TV series because hand in TV series is quite unconstrained in the sense that it highly articulated and it appears in different shape and size. You, know, you can have a close-up hand with very big, you can have something very small. So that is the source when you have a diverse uh, set of hands. Here are some example from the TV hand data set. By the way, it's publicly available. You can download it if you need. Um, okay, but then we have 10,000 images and we found that we, you know, it might not be enough. So we introduced uh, another data set called Coco hand data set. This one had about uh, 20, 26,000 images with 45,000 hands. And unlike the TV hand, uh, this one is semi-automatically labeled in the sense that uh, Coco comes with some annotation for the wrist uh, uh, of the hand, but it doesn't come with a hand mask. So what we do is we use a hand key point detection for, from open pose, and we introduce some heuristic to eliminate four positive and false negatives. Essentially, this is what we did. We looked at the detected key point, and if the distance between the risk and the detected uh, predicted risk and uh, uh, ground truth risk is smaller, some, some distance based on the bounding box of the key points, and we keep the detection. For example, in this case, all the yellow dots are the ones that return by, um, by the open pose, so we only keep the ones that, you know, good, and the, the ones that doesn't satisfy our heuristic, we remove them. But in training a network, not only you want to, because if you don't remove them, then what you have is full positive, okay? Uh, full positive in the data, which is bad for the training the detector. The second thing we need to make sure is we don't have false negative. The hand in the images, but you're not detected. So if you have false negative, then it means that, you know, it's supposed to be the hand, but you train the detector not to output a hand there. So essentially what we do is we mask out the undetected hands. So that's how we uh, remove the, or we mask out the un unnotated, uh, uh, remove false negatives. Okay, so finally we have two data set for hands. Uh, one is TV hand which about 10,000 images and Coco hand had about 27,000 images. Uh, and this is the comparison with some other uh, hand data set out there. 
uh, in terms of diversity, in terms of number of objects and the situation, I guess this is the most the largest data set for hands. Um, okay, so once we have the annotations, we the next step is to train the mass RCNN, right? That's uh, we can train a mass RCNN starting from a pre-trained detection network for different object classes. Uh, when we see the result, it's actually not very good. And there's too many full positive, and many skin area are mistaken as hands. And I will, you know, puzzle why, why, why that? And then after looking at the code and looking at uh, uh, discussing with my student, it turns out that in mass ASEAN, the way you train it, they have a step called hard negative mining. And in the case of mass RCNN, the way they do hard negative mining is the negative must kind of overlap somewhat with the object location. Essentially, the object location used for negative are the ones that are a little bit overlap with the hands, so they use negative. So the, some, some other areas, that the skin area, that uh, have similar skin tone with the hand, but they are not being used at negative. So, uh, so that's why it you know, if you see skin, it returns as a hand. And so it's the first thing that we try. So we fix it. Uh, um, okay, so, so we fix this, but Mass ASEAN still makes some trivial mistakes that we think it should not. For example, these are some cases when uh, essentially it has mistaken fit for hands, all right? And in some other cases, you know, uh, the right hand of the baby has not been detected. So why did mass RCNN make mistake? All right. So if you look at the, so for example, the highlighted boxes that you see here is the one that is has not been detected by by mass RCNN. Essentially, what we want is we want the detector to look at the region and say, okay, is this a hand or not? And if you magnify it, okay, as oh. You, you probably don't see it because uh, the contrast or you know, whatever doesn't. Even with the better contrast in my screen, it doesn't look like a hand. It could be a feet, a hand. It could be some other object. So essentially, it's very difficult to just look at the thing inside the box to tell whether it's an object of interest or not. Okay. So in many cases, we recognize it's a hand because of the surrounding context, you know, the something around it, not of the thing outside the box, not the thing inside the box, okay? So uh, we say, okay, so we should incorporate some context here. But how? So one way is to extend the bounding box like the, uh, uh, the, approach, uh, the approach of SSH, like, you know, you look at the region, uh, extend it a little bit. However, unlike for the case of face, hands uh, and human pose are extremely articulated, so it is not as regular as the head and shoulder case. So this one uh, also didn't work very well. So what we propose here is something called the contextual attention module that transform a feature map to another feature map that incorporates the context for detection here. Now, so the module here is designed to capture similarity and semantic context. Uh, Similarity context is essentially a region is more likely to be a hand if there are other regions with similar skin tones. Uh, semantic context is essentially the location of a hand can be inferred by the presence or absence of other semantically related body parts such as wrist and elbow. Um, so, uh, so the contextual module attention that we propose is the following. So. Uh, we so we want to transform the x uh, to y so f i i j to measure the similarity between two locations x i and x j c x i is a normalizing factor so to make it sum to one k is a number of imaginary body part category consider you know uh, now it doesn't have to be something real but like you can think about elbow one is uh, one e, e arm, something like that. And so we also incorporate the probability that IJ belong to the part category K. And DIJ is the distance between the two positions. And um, so the function HK inc 
decode the probability that the distance between a hand and a body part of category K is DIJ. Well, I, I know there's a lot of numbers, but uh, essentially you can you can come up with a parameterization for this function, and then at the end of the day, you have a set of learnable parameters that you can learn together with the detector. So if you do so, then uh, what we get is we, uh, we, we, we train something we call it hand CNN, which is the combination of mass RCNN with a contextual attention module, and it uh, outperforms the state of the art by a large margin in this case. Uh, so uh, if you want a hand detector for kind of like unconstrained situation in images, then I think we have the best uh, detector. Uh, so we also this is also the precision recall curve of hand CNN. Now one uh, one of the lessons that you already probably already all know is that the data is very important, and in this case we see that the Coco hand data set improve the performance a lot. So that by having more data, you improve the performance of the detector. So hands is important. Uh, data is important. So let me show you some of the uh, results comparing mass RCNN and hand CNN. So on the left is the result of mass RCNN, on the right is hand CNN. Uh, again, the left is mass RCNN, and on the right is hand CNN. Well, so of course, the hand CNN is not perfect, uh, and it still makes uh, mistakes. Uh, um, so so th these are some typical mistakes made by, uh, by the methods. So. I'm, I'm, I'm almost done, but maybe let me show you some more, a little bit, a uh, few more results, and then I'm done. So this is uh, detection, frame by frame detection. So there's no temporal smoothing. Uh, between the frames. Is, Also, there's an online demo if you want to try the own image uh, on that link. All right, so here's something, uh, hand detection on uh, Bangkok. All right, so it doesn't detect uh, everything, but you know, I, I guess uh, I myself think it's pretty good. Uh, this, uh, some other images, you don't see many hands. So this is this lunch, only detect my hands. This, uh, uh, not many people showing hands. There's one person raising the hand here, but it misses. <laughs> oh, I'm so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so, um, so general object detection with mass RCNN, I said that you can look at the Facebook detection on cafe. The one that we've been using is the PyTorch version. It's called the MetaPort, Mass RCNN. Uh, face detection, the SSH. Uh, hand detection, we have it. Um, the code is not online yet, but should be released in one week. Uh, the data, the demo has been already put online. So in summary, so today I talk about what is object detection. I tell you about the step in object detection. Uh, describe several uh, two approaches, two stage and single state approaches, and then one case study for hand detection. So this uh, hand detection work is also very uh, recent. This has been accepted for ICCV 19, which will be presented in two months, I guess. Okay, thank you.
Uh, any question? <laughs> As, uh, what is the vector in, in your hand De detection? The, the, vectors, the, vector, the vector is supposed to be the orientation of the hand, the one that connect from the center of the hand to... Uh, it's... Uh, yeah, so it's supposed to be um, the orientation of it. So uh, what? how do we define it? Uh, so, so the way that we predict is we predict the angle the angle of the hand and then we just plot the vector they have the orientation the angle of the hand is defined by the one that connect the wrist and the center of the hand the, the the wrist the predicted wrist location and the center of the hand yes what kind of application hand detection uh, i think there's many activity can be determined by uh, Detecting hands and understanding what hands are doing. For example, you can detect what object the person is holding, what you know, what is the activity. He pick it up, uh, pick up something, drop off something, or yeah. Um, yes. I'm not sure I understand the question. So, uh, detecting. Can you repeat what you just? I mean, uh, you were. I mean, just suggesting for hard negative examples for. So I mean, I mean these data sets which you were referring, for example, for multi. Uh, ethnicity and color spaces and uh, I mean uh, I mean in these uh, lower like ethnicity multiple skin tones and uh, age detection like expressions I mean face expressions like so uh, I just want to ask I mean are there any data sets uh, which uh, refer to these quoted uh, I mean, applications. No state of art research you have mentioned in your slides. I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> if so it's confu confusing, it's OK. Yeah. Um, so yes, uh, of course, uh, the data set, when tr we try to collect it, we, we don't want to inject any bias on it. But undoubtedly, it, it contains a lot of data set bias. You know, first of all, you raise a lot of uh, thing doesn't contain the, uh, uh, you know, it's it biased to the, the data sources we have. So I think it's also um, uh, one one trendy uh, direction to study is that you know how to uh, fairness in uh, AI or something like that. So some people are studying. I haven't looked into that problem yet, and I'm not aware of anything that. Uh, Talk about this, yes. But I do some, you know, some some some, some article talking about Facebook detector. It works for some certain area of uh, the world. It doesn't work for some area of s some certain country, basically. But, um, uh, yes. I would like to ask about uh, transfer learning. Uh, that uh, at the morning session that you say, uh, if we want to use the pretend model, you have to uh, use pretend model that relate to the uh, our outcome that we want. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, medical image, uh, I would like uh, you to suggest uh, is any network that can use to be a pretend for the medical image, like an uh, uh, X-ray film uh, or CT image? Uh, I, uh, I don't really work on this area, but uh, um, I think uh, that's uh, there should be some, okay. So I know that at least for uh, for uh, radiology images, like a lot of them has been taken over by deep learning. So they must be using something for the type of images that you are using. I'm not sure what it is, uh, but.
but you might, you know, if it's in medical images, I cry or whatever, there might be some other data set, some other tasks that you can do. Another approach is try to use something called like unsuper unsupervised learning, like learning something to based on auto intercoder to do reconstruction and use this as a starting point of so our network. That's the, on, another another approach that I also see people using. Thank you. So uh, I would like to suggest that we have one last question. And no. yeah. Sorry, but does a pretend model for those object detection really useful since there are many recent papers suggest that training from scratch is as effective as those pre-trained? Uh, actually, f for, for our case, we found that it pre using the pre-trained model is very important. First of all, uh, we don't really have a lot of review GPU resources, so we found that starting from pre-trained model is much faster. Uh, in some cases, we, uh, my student tried to train it from scratch, but they said that it didn't work as well. Uh, I I myself don't don't involve in the training, so I don't I can't tell you more than that. But so all right, um, let's. So if you have more questions, please come and ask offline. So for now, just thank Professor Thank you. Thank you.